And now, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Christina Vega, who will be joined along with Krista Perez, uh, Catherine Threat, Lydia K. Valentine, and Jesse Hanley Vega. How about now? Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. This is so strange and exciting to be at an in-person event, um, still in a time of COVID, but I appreciate that Town Hall Seattle made this safe environment and um, really just opened up the space to have us out here. Uh, as a publisher, this book, publishing this book was a dream come true. Um, as a woman of color myself, a queer woman of color, this, um, a non-binary queer woman of color. I'm getting, I'm getting better at naming my, my own um, intersectionalities. So as a publisher and all of those things, it was a dream come true to make this book. Um, and there are so many powerful women and non-binary folks in the greater Tacoma, Seattle, Pacific Northwest area. And um, I'm so excited to share just some of those readers and those words with you this evening. So thank you for coming out and for joining us. Um, as already mentioned, we are gonna have four readers this evening. And after we invite each of them up to the stage, we're gonna have a few questions for them. And then they'll read a little bit for us. And then at the end of the readings, we're gonna have a Q&A where you can ask questions. Um, and just hear a little bit more about these people and their stories. And as they already mentioned, uh, you can purchase a book or other books at the table after the reading. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our first reader, Krista R. Pettis. Krista is the founder and the president of the Tacoma Women of Color Collective and they have spent the bulk of her education and career learning and prioritizing anti-racist, equitable, and community-centered work. Her multidisciplinary perspective allows her to work through several lenses, which include being the daughter of an immigrant father and migrant mother worker, her undergraduate degree in law, economics, and public policy, and small business and entrepreneurial knowledge, and a passion for community organizing. These experiences inform the work of Krista and the work that she has done through nonprofit work, and she is a, and her person of color centered market, which is the community market, and her equity consulting business, Pettis Consulting. So please join me in welcoming Krista to the stage. Krista's is going to kill me for telling you all this, but this is her first time reading her work as a writer. So, yeah, exactly. So be gentle with Krista. I'm actually really glad that she said that because I was going to tell you because I just like getting it out there, right? Getting it out and open. Um, so hopefully it's not too awkward, but um, yeah, I'll just start. Can I ask you a few questions first? Oh, now? Yeah. Yeah. Or would you like to read first? You want to get it out of the way? Ask me some questions. Okay, questions first. So one of the questions that I have for Krista is, what was it like to transition from connecting with your audiences as primarily a workshop leader or using spoken dialogue and then writing it all down in the published book? <laughs> we were just talking about this question before. Um, before I came up here, I posted on Instagram that I was doing my first literary reading and I was like, what is my life? Like, I don't even know what this means. I don't know how you're supposed to do it, but it's just very different in some ways. Um, I think probably the most significant difference is that, you know, the way that I facilitate my workshops and um, I hate calling them trainings, but discussions is, it's really dynamic because it really, I really seek to engage everyone in the room, right? I know some folks don't wanna engage, you know, they wanna sit and process and, um, things like that, but I think that's the biggest difference. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna say something that maybe they're gonna think this is like what I think and what I've always thought, but it's always evolving. So it wasn't a question, but I would love to say that 
you know, I'm, I'm telling my story, parts of my story, but also the way we view our own stories evolves. And that's what I love about workshops. And I hope to somehow incorporate that into readings. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, which kind of brings me to another question. Um, thinking about, like you said, our own stories and how our relationship to our stories and ourselves changes over time. Is there anything that you would say to young writers or folks who maybe don't see themselves as writers? Any advice you would give them about sharing their story? Yeah, I would say if you have a story, then you have stories to share, right? Then you are a writer or you're a storyteller at the very least. You know, we all have stories and I think it's just whether or not we choose to share them and how we choose to share them. Um, I know that a lot of my story building, storytelling started in the notes of my iPhone. And then it got to a point where I was like, oh my gosh, I have so much to say. Like, <laughs> maybe I can write a book. And then I started <laughs> showing Christine and she was like, girl, you have a book. And I'm like, do I? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I guess just sharing that, you know, like my process, we all have stories and if you want to write, then you totally can. So yeah. that's where it's at. If you want to write, you totally can. That's what I spend my life trying to convince people <laughs> to believe. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And with that, I'm going to step off stage and give Krista the room. Thank you. So my story begins with my experience as a second grader. When I was told I did not belong due to the color of my skin and my ethnicity, that I needed to pick sides to choose only one friend because it had been decided that I was simply not friendship material. I was found unacceptable for friendship because of the color of my skin. I was devastated when I suddenly realized my differences and looking around, found no one to validate them. I felt clunky, awkward, ugly, and unwanted. If I cry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I felt I did not belong. I had never belonged, and I would never belong. As I grew older, I carried the shame of not belonging. I thought not belonging was somehow my fault. I never spoke Spanish for fear of, for fear that doing so would only further reinforce what I believed was now fact, that this place was not for me, that I was not for this place, that there was no place for me. The sense of never belonging compounded over time. Nothing ever fit, not clothes, friends, my place in the physical world. I felt like I was wearing an itchy shirt bunched up in places too tight in others and hanging awkwardly. Years passed by and because no one in my family ever named these differences, I couldn't quite put my finger on why I was so different from the children in my classes, from so many of our community members. Now though, I know what made me different. It was and is the juxtaposition of my Christian American behavior that I was taught, right? those expectations, and the Catholic Mexican values I was raised with. It's my Mexican-American experience laced with the metaphysical, the whisper of mystery that we can never quite hold, but we know that it exists. It was and is my visceral drive for survival and my simultaneous yearning for rest, ease, and luxury. My experience has always been that I'm caught between what I was told is my birthright and what has been my experience since birth. As people of color, many of us are told stories of who we are, where we come from, and what we can expect. On occasion, our elders or peers will tell us that we deserve more, that we belong here, that everything we dream of can be ours. But then we're grounded by the reality of being us and walking through this world with our skin language, and any other identifier that says we don't belong. It wasn't until I started being a community with other people of color, with other BIPOC, that I realized that experiencing my trauma 
and witnessing trauma take hold of everyone around me was a shared experience. Of course, our traumatic experiences were different, but we were all constantly going through them in ways I didn't see happening to other non-BIPOC folks around me, especially when I was young. Yet it wasn't the trauma bonding us together. It was that every day we choose to stand in joy, not oppression and suffering. It's the joy we deliberately choose, weaving the spiritual, the physical, and the unbearable together. But outside of those BIPOC spaces, I sense that no matter what I did, I would never belong. No matter how carefully I twisted myself into smaller clothes, drab colors, or airless spaces, it wasn't for me, and I wasn't for it. Somehow the world just wasn't for me, and I wasn't for this world. Even though I'd learned to breathe when there was no air left, somehow this world still wasn't for me. I still wasn't doing quite enough to make this place a perfect fit. Perfect fit, you know, like when they're hiring you. You're not quite, quite the, the thing we're looking for. You're just not the right fit for the job. I just wasn't accommodating enough. I don't speak soft enough. I get too fired up when I speak. I show up so unapologetically that folks get comfortable. Even switching to Spanish to accommodate non-English speakers makes some white folks just uncomfortable. The sense of tension I felt in each of these moments silently told me that I just didn't quite fit in these spaces. So I left everyone and everything behind. I went where I had always belonged, where I had always fit, where there was always enough air for me to breathe. I went to stories, information, books, which held space for me to be someone I wanted to be, space to rest and to have ease and luxury. There in those books, I crafted a beautiful world made up of all the best parts of life, the medicinal quality of food and how we cure ourselves with it. Every day, how we use food for less of the physical need, but more of the emotional salve that it provides for us. How we use medicine from the earth herbs, tinctures, and teas to access the metaphysical. How we heal ourselves use, using anything that we can. I long to feel my culture like this. There are small things that I miss, like the smell of the herbal tea my grandmother would make me to soothe my stomach, or the dish she makes every time we visit. Carne en su jugo, that's my faith. Or maybe it's the corridos my grandfather played as he sat under the tree in his backyard, with a cold Budweiser in his hand, enjoying the sun and the breeze on his face. During the hardest points in my life, it was books and stories that took me away that made me feel like I belonged someplace. As I became a young adult, and then a small business owner, oh shoot, I need to hurry. <laughs> a small business owner at the age of 19, I learned the power of building community through food and common experience as a mobile kitchen owner. La Estrella del Norte, where we serve Mexican street food, all made from scratch, by the way. It was the first taco truck in Kalispell, Montana. Yep, I lived in Kalispell, Montana for 10 years. We can talk about that later, it's crazy. <laughs> I was the cook, the taco lady, and my mother made the handmade flour tortillas, salsa, and served our customers. My five-year-old little sister, would husk the tomatillos, refill the condiments, and wipe down the tables. You better believe she got tips, okay? We were known for running La Estrella del Norte as a family, for bartering with our tamales, and for making custom orders for our regulars. Owning La Estrella del Norte was what I consider to be my first taste of cultivating and being in community. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Krista. Can we give it up one more time for Krista? That was amazing.
Thank you for your vulnerability. Our next reader this evening is Catherine Threat. Catherine Threat is a mixed race writer from the DC area who focuses her writing on the subjects of race, identity, and the concept of home. She graduated from the University of Puget Sound with a BA in art history and English creative writing and is passionate about generating and maintaining safe and encouraging spaces for young artists to express themselves and share their art. She wants to work with contemporary artists of all media and foster sympathetic, earnest, and socially active communities through art. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Catherine Threat to the stage. Hello, Kate. Hello. Oh, it's so good to see Kate. Kate and I have worked together in many different capacities over the last few years. Um, yes, several. <laughs> several, yeah. And watching Kate navigate through post um, undergraduate reality of COVID and like finding work and finding work that she's passionate about has been incredible. Um, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions before you read? I would love for you to ask yes. me some questions. Okay. Um, so as someone who works with the press, and for those of you who don't know, Kate works at Blue Cactus Press um, and is phenomenal, does a bunch of stuff with us. Um, but I'm wondering, are there any aspects of producing a book that still surprised you as a contributor to this, even though you work with several different presses? Yes. Um, it's less so about the, because um, I've worked on things that were like culminations and projects with various artists before, but what really surprised me about this was um, how many people we got to show up, because Christina is always talking about um, getting people to like take the draft out of their folder, out of their drawer. They don't want to send their files, y'all. Yeah, always People talking like, about I like, got a book. actually sending the file, and because it's actually kind of hard to get people to send their stuff and like be willing to share it. And I was just kind of like so pleasantly heartwarmed, and like it just made me feel so good and happy about the world that we had so many people who were willing to share with each other and had so much to say. And um, it's just a, it was kind of beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing, yeah. And the the breadth of the writing in the book is really delightful as well. We have so many folks who have never shared their work publicly. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have so many folks who are seasoned writers with multiple books. Um, so getting to work with all of those folks was wonderful. Um, a lot of Kate's writing deals, like I mentioned in her bio, with home in the DC area. And I'm also wondering, have you found similar inspiration in the landscape of the Pacific Northwest? Yes, but it's, it's such a complicated answer, I think. Um, a lot of the things I write about, and I'll reference some of them when I read in a couple minutes, are nowhere near here, and they're very far away. And I think part of what makes it so much easier to write about them is the distance I currently have that I can kind of set it apart and look at it from an outside perspective. Um, so I'm definitely, I'm gaining an inspiration and I'm like like gathering all this material, but I, it's still taking me a little bit of time to actually like be able to sit down and look at it all and parse it into something that's actually, I don't know. <laughs> that has a cohesive message in it. But um, I think I'm currently starting to reconcile with how I felt arriving here, which I guess now is like six years ago, which is crazy. Um, so maybe the longer I stay, the more I'll have to say, as I can distance each little experience a little bit more and actually look at it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, without any further ado, let's let's give it up for Kate. And Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just gonna figure out this microphone real quick. Yeah, 
Yeah, just some elevator muzak. I've never used this before, so I hope, is this right? Nice. <laughs> I'm learning so much and you're all learning with me. This is precious. Okay. Um, yeah, so I have four things I'm gonna read. The first one is, it's gonna kind of be an interesting situation for me, so we'll all get through it together. I've never actually performed this piece out loud. Um, if you get the book, which you should, um, it's formatted very oddly, and so I've never actually read it as an audio thing, but I, I tried to figure it out this week, so we'll see how it goes. And this first poem is called, To the Confederate Ancestors Who Shall Remain Nameless and Due to the Laws of History and Legacy Disappear. Okay. Not all racists, years ago, benefit of the doubt, forgiveness of the time, allied, associated, united, adjective, joined by agreement or treaty. Reckon with the fact blood that nourished, flourished to get here now may kill you. Kill to own you, kill to rape you and sell your children in a heartbeat. But times change, right? Associate, partner, accomplice, collaborator, colleague. Noun, a person one works with. Do I bother to ask why? Do I want to ask why? Is there another excuse, reason, or is it just I want to know which of them were actually brave enough to say it to my face here now? Thank you. I'm too tall for this thing. Okay. My second poem is called Vocabulary. I have not been to many places beyond where the roots of my family linger. But linger is not the right word. What do you call a home that at once is yours and not yours at all? What do you call a place where women gave birth again and again to women, to children who could not know them and could not love them? What do you call a place where the hatred that this country is founded on conflates into a single person? And is person the right word for a symbol of love and hatred if that symbol can walk and love and cry but must do so alone? And country is not the right word either for places like this, where bloodshed is law and reason is a white man's knuckle dug into the flesh of anything he is afraid of. Sorry, I don't know how to fix it. I'm technologically impaired a little. Thank you, Christine. You're a lifesaver. Okay, I'm cheating a little. Um, I wanted to, since as we already talked about with Christina, a lot of the poems that I have in this are based on places that are not here, and I wanted to bring something that I have written here, that I feel strongly here, and that I'm currently very connected to. So this is a more recent poem and then I'll get back to the good stuff. Um, this poem is called Worship in a Honda Accord. I have been slow dancing with the idea of God. I'm not arrogant enough to think she has actually held my hand. But when I was young, my mother told me not to say the Lord's name in vain, and to this day I will still say fuck and gosh in the same sentence. Whether this is out of fear or reverence, I cannot say. Oh, but when Faith and I step out to the dance floor of my bedroom rug or well-worn gravel paths, stepping in time with some modified waltz, we glide atop my nightmares and she whispers miracles into my ears. Isn't it wonderful the way the earth smells when it has just rained, the way the animals sing when it is dry again, the way the moon and the stars and the ancestors have been watching it all, all this time? Sometimes the miracles have nothing to do with me at all. Sometimes grandfathers long passed away speak to me in the side yard. Sometimes they never come back to visit again. 
Sometimes they come back and I do not realize until I am lying awake at night after the waltz is over. Sometimes the miracles have nothing to do with any of us at all. Sometimes I am lying awake at night and my body is still warm where it has been wrapped around faith and invocation. And sometimes I am cold and this is okay too. I have not been to church for what is usually deemed quite some time. I am in church nearly every day because what is more holy than watching the bleeding yellow colors of the evening on bended knee every night? Prayers belong to the sky. What is a pew if it is not the faded car seat where I sing the same songs over and over again? Are these not hymns, these words I sing in my sleep? Faith rises in the empty space between my body and the sounds that move it. When I am not singing, I am waiting for the waltz. The sun will always set again, and I am but a humble servant. What is a church if it can be confined by walls in a time of day? What is a faith? It is in the breath, in the miracles whispered below the volume of a loved one's laughter, blown in with the wind of the sun passing overhead, pushing the believer's feet back and forth across the abbey floor, and I am listening closely. Thank you. That's the first time I performed that one too, so that's exciting. Okay, got one more. And this is the oldest poem that I have in this. Um, so I went from something I've never performed before to something I've performed the most out of all this. So, and thanks again, everyone. Um, this poem is called My Father Yells at Confederate Statues. We are in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Lookout Mountain watches sleepily from the horizon over land where generation after generation has loved, cured, and buried each other. My genes are woven into the dirt, history from before legibility. The summer is green and lush and beautiful, and curls damp with sweat stick to my ears and neck. Someone somewhere is always playing music, and someone somewhere is always singing along. The air smells of barbecue and blooming trees. There are tour buses heading to the plantations near the river. We are not on them. There is a white man, my father tells me, many generations ago, who snuck into the smooth brown bark of the family tree. I forget this information for years, being too young to understand the implications, to hold a mirror to generational trauma and face the patterns on the other side. We are passing an old graveyard and the sky looks like rain. My father yells at Confederate tombstones to remind them that they lost and I am too young to yell with him. I am not yet angry enough. We return to black neighborhoods with black mothers and pick berries together dark and sweet. Let's give it up one more time for Kate Threet. And I don't know if we've said this out loud yet, Kate, but Kate has a chat book coming out maybe around the end of the year, maybe around then. Uh, so keep a lookout for Kate's work. And I should have mentioned earlier as well that Krista also has a book coming out this year in October. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. And I would like to introduce our next reader, Jesse Hanley Vega. Jesse Hanley Vega is a native of the Bronx and a transplanted to Komen. A former screenwriter and documentary filmmaker, Jesse now finds joy as a book editor, writing instructor, and communications consultant. When not working, Jesse loves writing fiction, practicing guitar, and bouncing on her mini trampoline. She's also a fantastic cook. Jesse is the mom of two and the stepmom of two more, and is deeply grateful for her loving partner, Mark. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Jesse to the stage. Testing, I think that's good. Hi. 
<laughs> Questions first. Or? Questions first, great. Um, so Jesse's work always moves me. And um, one of the wonderful things about the essay, the memoir essay uh, in this anthology is that it's very much about standing in your power um, and sort of coming into that. A lot of us, especially women of color, I think, um, take quite a bit of, it takes time to to believe in yourself and then to be able to project that. And so I'm just wondering, Jesse, if writing had a place in that journey for you. Um, I, I read this question before I got here and I didn't have an answer earlier today. I, I'm just gonna make something up. That's great, <laughs> that's what we're all doing, that's what life is. So um, I started out as an actor and then I was a playwright and then I was a screenwriter and a documentary filmmaker. And um, I, I, I was, um, had some talent, uh, but I was kind of floundering around, I would say. And um, by the time I stopped being a screenwriter, I was totally burnt out. And in retrospect, what I see is that I was always trying to write on top of what was actually true for me and who I really was. So did the writing have um, a place in me finding the power? Not necessarily, um, but it was a mirror for that I could not reflect myself authentically in my work. So no matter what I, I wrote, there was always something missing. And um, it was really this moment that I write about in this essay when that thing showed itself to me, like what was missing from all my work, and it really transformed my ability to speak. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Thank you. um, you're welcome. If you all have, some folks in the room I know have gotten a chance to know, to get to know Jesse a little bit, um, and there's a, a wonderful joyfulness and playfulness and maybe whimsicality to Jesse's personality. Um, and I think that some of that joy is translated in the anthology as well. It's one of the things that we wanted to be careful that we didn't just bring out a book that was full of anger and trauma and pain and frustration. We wanted to also showcase the joy and the celebration um, that we all feel and that is in our work as well. And I'm wondering, after reading the anthology, Jesse, or bits and pieces of it, um, what, what feelings were you left with after this? So when I saw that question, I spent the afternoon in bed with the anthology, like going through everything. Um, what really um, stood out to me was looking at it as a whole, these moments that would jump out at me of really authentic, genuine um, emotion isn't even the the good enough word for it, like feeling. And it was the whole range. Like you said, it was it's the range of trauma, of um, inherited trauma, of trauma from our own lives. And then um, beauty, right? Beauty and color and electricity. And so um, I, I was really reading it through the filter of your question. I was really aware how I felt like the entire world was is contained in the anthology, and um, it gave me a whole new appreciation of it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, that's lovely. And just honestly, y'all, as a publisher, having contributors that like sit in bed reading the book all day, that's golden, that's golden, thank you. Um, please join me in welcoming Jessie to read her work. Thank you. Also, Christina, no one ever called me whimsical before, and I, really appreciate it because <laughs> I've been trying to find myself and I, I guess that's me, whimsy. Okay, um, so the name of this essay is Latina Resurrected and um, I'm gonna read it as it's written but I'll say that my voice has evolved so much since I wrote it that I may like edit as I go along. Um, it was August 19th, 2017 and I was protesting racism one week earlier at a Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, a white nationalist drove his Dodge Challenger into the crowd and killed a counter-protester named Heather Heyer. 
At the time, I was a leader in a local political action group, and hours after the attack, two young activists reached out to ask for my help in organizing a local protest. For the next few days, they worked around the clock, and on the following Saturday, we gathered with a few hundred other protesters at Candle Park on Tacoma's north side. Though the organizers had hoped to hold the event at People's Park in Tacoma's historically black hilltop neighborhood, our last minute mobilization meant that the only site available was on Tacoma's predominantly white north side, a change in venue that meant a change in audience as well. It was one of those summer days when it can seem like the whole city is out celebrating, so the energy was high even though the mood was somber. Addressing the crowd of mostly white protesters, local politicians and community leaders spoke out against racism, violence, and all the other sewage that had risen to the surface since the 2016 election. That sewage, which had been steaming beneath the surface of American society for generations, was a big surprise to a lot of white people, but no surprise at all to black folks and other people of color who'd been living with it all their lives. And it was no surprise to me. Though I'd been living in University Place, a fairly affluent area of West Tacoma, for almost five years, I'd grown up in the Bronx. When the last speaker of the day, Mayor Marilyn Strickland, a black woman, who I later found out is actually biracial, she's black and Korean, um, when she took the mic, I expected the usual, a fairly rousing, if politically safe, speech about overcoming differences and the power of the people. But instead of sticking to the script, Mayor Strickland veered hard into keeping it real and asked that the people of color come stand with her to face the audience. She wanted the whites in the crowd to take a good long look, to connect with the humanity of the people in front of them, and to rem remember that these were the people whose lives they were there to honor and protect. These were Tacoma's people of color. Standing on the grass near the mayor, I froze. As two crowds formed in front of me, I stayed right where I was. As an uneasiness I'd been accustomed to tuning out, one I'd been suppressing for years, became impossible to ignore. In Mayor Strickland's moment of reckoning, I finally admitted to myself that I didn't know where I belonged. My mother was born in Puerto Rico and moved to New York City when she was five. Like me, my father had been born and raised in the Bronx. He has a mix of Jewish, I wrote Jewish, German, and Irish ancestry, but since then I got my DNA tested and we have zero Irish. So that was like made up somehow. <laughs> um, when I was a kid in the 70s, the Bronx was notorious for burning down. And when I was a teenager, it was known for crack. But in my neighborhood provided a relative sanctuary among otherwise dangerous streets. Known as the Amalgamated, it was a socialist housing cooperative that had been founded by Jewish trade unionists in the 1920s. By the early 70s, when its original founders had gotten old and their kids had moved away, the neighborhood was seeking fresh new cooperators. My parents, who'd first met on the subway, weren't the only young people to emerge from the 60s married to someone from another race or ethnicity. So together with a group of my dad's high school and city college friends, they joined the cooperative, eager to create a kind of radical, politically woke utopia for their young mixed families. My memories of those years are alternately vivid and hazy, playing Star Wars with Douglas Hill, who was black and Jewish, run catch kiss with Peter Pinero, who's black and Puerto Rican, and Wilderness family in the park with the Stanton girls who were Irish and Italian, which did count as being mixed in the Bronx. As in so many communities, our families picnicked, barbecued, and discoed together. And I paid close attention as the dads argued loudly about sports and politics, and the moms volunteered at the local food co-op. And then at the onset of a new decade, I witnessed my entire neighborhood mourn the election of Ronald Reagan. Disgusted by, the barely, disgusted by the barely disguised racism of his campaign, my parents, their friends, and all our neighbors knew that his dual promises of trickle-down economics and a war on drugs, war on drugs, would cause even further disaster in poor areas like ours, and they did. But while our block survived the Reagan administration, us kids couldn't stay in the amalgamated forever. Regardless of race or ethnicity, our parents wanted better futures for the younger generation. And that meant educations that would take most of us out of the Bronx 
and into worlds that looked nothing like our neighborhood. In my case, those worlds consisted of Vassar College and the University of Chicago, elite, overwhelmingly white institutions where young people are rigorously groomed to take their places as the intellectual, artistic, political, and financial leaders of tomorrow, and uphold the inequality that dominates American culture. <laughs> Bring it. Uh, so there I was in Candle Park, and Mayor Strickland seemed to be asking me personally, who are you? Are you that little girl growing up in the Bronx, eating gandules at Abuela's house? Are you an amalgamated kid running around Van Cortlandt Park with your radical black, brown, and Jewish friends? Are you a stylish Vassar girl? A West Side mom with a blue-eyed husband and a yoga practice? Are you brown, white, a Puerto Rican, a Jew? Are you nothing? Despite my progressive upbringing, I'd grown up absorbing the cultural cues about race and ethnicity that American culture fed me, especially the ones about Latinas. I knew that Puerto Rican girls were hypersexualized badasses and bad students, so I did what I could to assure that white people liked and accepted me as their relatively modest, even-tempered equal. As a teenager, I'd made sure not to wear nameplate necklaces or bamboo hoops, and into my mid-20s worked to eliminate any race of a distinctive Bronx accent, which you can notice I have zero Bronx accent. By the time I was an adult, I was fully accepted as white, and most people had no idea who I really was or where I was from. Unless the topics of race, class, or poverty came up. Then, in a self-righteous rage, I'd give myself away as a hot-blooded Latina and feel the ground I'd gained, as well as the misplaced trust I'd earned, slip away. But radical politics aside, I did nothing to maintain a connection with other people of color. Instead, in pursuit of the elusive better life, I continued gravitating towards white environments, which provided me with the resources and proximity to power I wanted, while rejecting whatever reminded me too much of the, powerless, the powerlessness I'd felt at home. In other words, just as my parents and all the other parents in our community had wanted, I was living the American dream. And I was all fucked up. Yes, I'd gotten out of the Bronx, gotten that excellent education, traveled all over the world, Yes, I'd had the privilege of following my passions as an artist and spiritual seeker, but I'd failed to achieve the fulfillment I'd been seeking, and there was a fundamental way in which I still felt mute and powerless. Indistinct feelings of shame and guilt haunted me, and rather take full advantage of the so-called opportunities around me, I suffered from recurring cycles of depression, anxiety, and confusion that left me feeling like I always had to start over. Having mastered the habit of self-sabotage, I often did. So like I said, there I was, standing next to the mayor of Tacoma. I'm 47 years old, and once the initial panic had passed, considering that my dysfunction was related, it, sorry, I'm like, how, what does this sentence mean? There I was, standing next to the mayor of Tacoma, considering that my dysfunction was related to this divide into groups thing and that my chronic uneasiness about race being mixed and seeming white had messed with my mind more than I'd thought. Moments later, it was my turn to take the mic. In a split second, I decided for the first time ever I was going to speak, to this, I was going to speak this truth. I declared to the crowd that not only was I the daughter of a Puerto Rican mother and a Jewish father, but that I was confused about it. I admitted that Mayor Strickland's request had touched a wound I didn't know I had, and I told everyone there that day, everyone who had come out to protest Charlottesville and Proud Boys and Trump and racism, that I didn't know where I belonged. Then I thanked Mayor Strickland for giving me something to think about, and having made my public confession, which probably took less than a minute, I did what I was there to do. I thanked the speakers, acknowledged the organizers, and reminded everyone to call their congresspeople. Until that day in Candle Park, people would often say to me, what are you? Or, you're Puerto Rican, I never would have guessed. Or, you're the whitest Latina I've ever met. And while they were busy thinking how cool or exotic that was, I would stammer, turn red, or look away. But after that day, I began taking steps to articulate my unique perspective as a Latina of mixed heritage. I began to understand why it mattered that I do that, and also discovered how much I wanted to support other marginalized people to do the same. 
A few months after my moment at the mic, I began attending the conversation, a weekly gathering in which Tacomans share personal experiences of race and educate themselves about the history and practice of racism in America. In that sacred space, I admitted how badly I'd always longed to talk about my experiences and was surprised by how much grief lay buried beneath my modest and even-tempered persona. I'd never before shared publicly about my childhood and I was startled by the intense vulnerability and fury I felt. No, no, not only about my heritage, but about growing up in a place where white landlords openly profited from burning down black and brown neighborhoods. In telling these truths and in witnessing other people's reactions to them, I discovered that these experiences, as well as my journey from one of the poorest areas in the US to some of the wealthiest, had given me a valuable perspective on race, economics, and caste. That time I spent engaged with the conversation taught me that the confusing circumstances of my youth, which had always felt like a curse, were a great gift, and I began speaking and writing about them more openly. Within minutes of my speech, volunteers began dismantling the podium and taking down banners, and I started weaving a path through the crowd. I felt shaky about what I had just said, and I could feel my heart beating. Lost in a swirl of self-consciousness, I would have just walked straight to my car if it hadn't been the protesters who began approaching me one at a time. The first was the activist I'd been working with all week. She told me that she was mixed, too. In delayed recognition, I thought, oh, right, and confessed to also feeling conflicted. Another protester told me that she'd written a book about her mixed Asian upbringing and now felt more at peace. And yet another gave me a hug. It wasn't at all what I'd been expecting. It, it wasn't even what I'd hoped for, but it was exactly what I needed. In the years between graduating college and moving to Tacoma, I'd been presented with numerous opportunities that had seemed desirable on the surface. A fellowship here, an interested producer there, a fantastic job offer at a major studio over there. But to the dismay of my parents and the people who cared about me, I blew them up one after the other often only partially understanding what I'd done. Now I understood that these invitations to ascend in white society as a whitish person on purely white terms were not something my soul could accept. There was a time when I thought the ambivalence and shame I felt about my racial and ethnic identity were insignificant private matters, which would never be resolved and most certainly never revealed. It never occurred to me that one day I would change my own life and my own definition of who I was, by speaking them out loud, not from a place of blame or victimhood, but from a place of curiosity and courage. By declaring on that summer day in Tacoma what I, genu what I genuinely felt about who I genuinely was, I asserted my Latina identity as a political and spiritual act and began to embrace new possibilities that were far different from the ones that had tormented me earlier. These new possibilities have resulted in a different kind of life than the one I used to think I wanted. I'm still creative, but now my fulfillment comes not only from my own expression, but from nurturing and celebrating artists of color dedicated to expressing their truths, paradoxes, and all. As an editor, a writing instructor, and a communications professional, I work joyfully to amplify voices of color because I know firsthand the difference it makes. This kind of truth-telling brings liberation, it brings freedom and it brings change, not only to the stories, tellers, and listeners, but to the world. Thank you. Let's give it up for Jesse one more time, please. Jesse's writing and also just Jesse, being in community with Jesse is always a, a great reminder that it's so important to speak our stories out loud, especially the ones that we are feeling shame about or feeling uncertainty in our body about, um, because there are so many other folks like us that feel that way too and who, who don't know that they can give themselves permission to say it out loud. So thank you, Jesse, for being one of those people that stands as a, an example for us. Uh, before I invite our last reader up this evening, I do want to just acknowledge very quickly we are running a little short on time. So we're going to have our last reader, and then we'll keep the Q&A a little bit shorter than we um, initially thought to give folks enough time to purchase books and chat with others and things like that. Uh, but first, I would like to invite 
our last reader this evening, Lydia K. Valentine, to the stage. Yeah, let's do that. Let's applause first. You can come up, absolutely. Lydia K. Valentine is a playwright and poet, a director and dramaturg, editor and educator. Her proudest accomplishment, though, is being a mom to two creative, intelligent, and caring individuals and activists. In her own writing and the products and projects to which she contributes through Literary Inc., Lydia seeks to amplify the voices of those who are often stifled, ignored, and marginalized in what has been the accepted narrative of the United States. Lydia's first poetry collection, Brief Black Candles, was published in November 2020 by Not A Pipe Publishing, and we do have that here today. And she is the current Tacoma Poet Laureate. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you. It'll, you're fine. Mm -hmm. oh, I'll try to. All right. Hello. Oh. There's a, a sound wizard in the back. Yay. <laughs> um, do you have the are questions okay before yes, we begin? Thank you. I, I don't know why I'm making the questions thing weird every time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question is pretty straightforward. Um, most people don't know that the title, We Need a Reckoning, is a line from one of Lydia's poems in the book. And so I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind giving folks a little bit of background info about that poem, that moment. Yeah, sure. Um, one of my, I tend to answer circuitously. Um, I'm autistic and that comes out a lot when I speak, but um, I was having a Zoom writing session with some um, writer friends uh, who are dispersed across the country on New Year's Eve 2020. And um, we used that as a prompt, just the fact that it was New Year's. And the poem came out almost completely the way that it ended up. Um, and at the end of 2020, obviously, you know, we'd all been through unprecedented times. And the racial uprising seemed imminent, you know, lots of change and things. and. Um, so I was just thinking about how the ball drops and, you know, there's all this revelry and it's like a fresh start every year, but that there are many ways that it wasn't going to be a fresh start. And also I'm a bit of, um, a Shakespeare scholar. I'm a Shakespeare nerd. And so, um, some of the lines that are in there are references to the Scottish play and, and my favorite quote within the Scottish play, which no, I'm not going to say, because um, <laughs> I do better reading than... Uh, I've got to pay attention yeah, to get that one. Yeah, it's really, and, and that comes out a lot, I think, in my writing, so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I'm going to give Lydia the big, big question. Um, what do you hope folks take away from this reading, this book, this experience? Yeah, um, I think a lot of people downplay Tacoma. Um, I think, I mean, yeah, right? I think that a lot of people are moving there because of the, you know, to escape prices from um, Seattle and uh, California and stuff. And, you know, I had a friend at work say, oh, T-Town is on the come up. And I'm like, no, we've been who we are and we've been awesome. And so I would like people to take away the fact that we have so much great art, so many great artists, and for those of us who are a part of the global majority, I want them to have as many times where they read something and thought, mm, as I did, you know, some of the, the pieces that were read today, you know, I, they just resonate with me. And so that, I think, is my biggest hope for people. Um, sometimes, as people of the global majority who are in Tacoma or Washington State or, you know, this side, we are always looking for each other. And we are here. You know, we're out here. We are doing our thing, making our mark. Um, so that's what. Out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get off the stage so Lydia can Wait. speak some truth. Please. You might want to stay just oh. in case I have difficulty. Just a minute. Oh. So I'm going to move that for you. I got you. Uh, hey, yes. Yeah, I love a podium. All right. 
Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, great. So it's been a week, y'all. And um, when I was coming today, I thought we would keep our masks on. So all I can think right now is one, I missed an opportunity to wear my favorite lipstick, which in this world, you know, we never get a chance to do that. And that my aunt and my mom and dad are probably looking down on me, thinking about my ashy lips. And the fact that my nose hairs are long as uh, probably Rapunzel's. I, I messaged Christina earlier because I took a, a picture of my, my puppy and me in the morning. And I was like, oh my gosh, my nose hairs are like incredibly long. Like they were just sticking out. And so I can, I can imagine that they are going, mm, 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 that child. Um, but I'll just pretend that nobody's seeing that. And, um, and also, I want to say happy Black History Month. Even um, it's one of the reasons that February is a great month, even though Black History is American history, and so it really should be every day. Um, Monday is Valentine's Day. I'm Lydia Valentine. And my birthday is two weeks after that. So, you know, if you want to send me a happy birthday message or a happy note or bubble gum or cotton candy, you know, I take gifts all year, but February is awesome. So, all right, here we go. Um, I'm going to read the poem uh, New Year's Eve 2020, and that has the reference to We Need a Reckoning. And then um, right after that, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote this New Year's Eve, which is in conversation with the first one. So, New Year's Eve 2020. They seem to think that when the ball drops and the bells peal, these layers of grime and greed, of gaslight and gunpowder, of grief and grievances will peel away. Consequence can't be trampled up so easily. These four years are not the foundation of our country's faults. Blood-washed sediment began to settle on these shores 400 years ago, and even more has piled on and piled on and piled on every new year, every new day since. Truckloads and handfuls of malice, sly verbal microbullets at best, state-sanctioned viral murders at worst, are dumped and thrown like ground glass powder cast into the air. We of all castes breathe this airborne malignance. We of all castes are coated with it inside and out. Black life here has forever been a bloody business. Our pain, the perverse entertainment of picnic lynchings, phone filmed lynchings, souvenir postcards, and social media posts. So no, the reign of that unprecedented poser president was not the start but it and he legitimized and lithified these layers of toxicity. What we need is a reckoning, a wrecking ball, to reduce the white supremacist systems of this republic to dust, to exhume and exalt our milled bones and our milled benevolence. Then maybe the be all and end all, the dream that could be America will be. Part two, New Year's Eve 2021. People ask if I have any happy poems. <laughs> I want exultation, fairy lights. Each word is loud and bold, a celebration as the small black stars of a murmuration, screaming songs despite that meek name, swooping and swirling as they return to a home that last year was inhospitable, but now, would be safe and warm. Trust and believe that like the starling, I want light. But what I have for you are hard truths. Inconvenient stars that congregate, disrupt, and claim space as their own were brought to these shores to be ornamental, not safe. Safety is a promise spoken backward. It's a one-legged chair on a newly waxed floor a key to a door whose locks have changed, a pledge written by a poor strategist 
for a promising politician's campaign speech. The ruinous ivy roots of archies, isms, and ists have sneaky ways of snagging, swinging wrecking balls and stalling, if not stopping, if not reversing, any rambling toward any reckoning threatening their intricate systems. But excavation has begun. And happy or not, we fight on. All right. I'm going to read the Thank you. I'm going to read um, one last piece. Um, this, like the, the last portion, is not in the book, um, but it is. Oh, shoot, I forgot which one I was going to read. Um, let me just think for a minute. I'm so sorry. La, 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 la. Um, oh, yes. So this um, poem was written in part of um, the 20th anniversary and celebration of Tacoma Arts Month, which was this past October. And it is a poem for Tacoma's creatives. Art in our gritty city of destiny is a fire that never rests. It erupts in a torrent carrying pride and passion, hope and healing. It smolders in coals that refuse to be banked, even when buried in packed ash layers of economic disappointments, even when drowning in the insistent flood of gentrified waters from the north and from the south. It flickers sly fingers, reaching out to awaken our eyes, our ears, our minds, burning its way through us or to us or both. Art in our gritty city of destiny is a fire that never rests because it does not forget the past. This living blaze honors ancestral caretakers of this land and ancestral caretakers of our hearts. It remembers and recognizes those harmed and those herded away. It works to remove rooted blights of injury and injustice. Its smoke whispers our worries and wishes. It sings of our mountain, our city's most sincere soul. It fills our mouths, our throats, our lungs with an air that sustains us, even when the suffocating toxins from rancid politicians and societal systems cannot be escaped. Even when the waves of this virus continue to crest higher and higher, and there is little civil air, safe air to breathe. Our art, our people, are a fire of gritty persistence and power, and we will never rest. Thank you. Can we give it up for Lydia one more time? And actually, let's give it a round of applause to all of our readers as we welcome them, welcome them back to the stage. Please and thank you. so nervous y'all look at us <laughs> thank you all for sticking with us uh, this evening and I we have a couple of questions on the iPad but I want to open it up to you folks first is there anyone in the audience who's got a question for the readers maybe I'll break the ice with one of these questions um, well, actually, let's just start with a little, with a, a mini question. This is for Kate. Kate, will the new poem you read be in your upcoming chapbook? It sure will. <laughs> All right, okay. So that's something to look forward to. And the, actually, this is going to be a two-parter. So this question is also for you, Kate. As 
and forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly, as an Oglala Lakota woman raised in the religion that waged genocide against my ancestors, your poem about what is a church if it can be confined to a place and a time was powerful. Where can they read or hear that again? Um, in the interim. <laughs> in the interim, it, it exists in the ether and in my computer. <laughs> Um, so maybe you'll all just have to get a chat book if you really want to read it again. I will probably post it somewhere, so if, if people want to enjoy it. Is this being saved, this event? I believe so. You can also watch it there. <laughs> and where can folks find your work online? If you were to post it, where would you post it? Yeah, currently, I'm, a website is in the works. I currently only have an Instagram, really, and it's just Kate dot threat, spelled threat. So if you want to remember, it's Kate dot threat. So on Instagram, but you pronounce it three, FYI. Pronounce it three, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Give her a break. <laughs> okay, so that was our icebreaker question. Thank you for doing that, Kate. No um, any questions in the audience today? Go ahead, please. I was actually just thinking about this as we were sitting down, so I can go first, unless someone else wants to go first. Um, I personally, I feel like for me, I, talking to me, I sound very different than the poems that I write, and I tend to be much more optimistic and kind of uh, cheerful person, I think. And I think for me, all of these like hard times and unprecedented hashtag we live in a society and all that, I tend to get it out in the writing and for me it exists there and once I get those feelings out that's where they are and it really helps me unload and sometimes they're really bad and I'm just like writing a rage paragraph for an hour um, but then it's out and for me that's honestly just what makes me feel way better. So. Oh, okay. I just had to say, I wrote a rage paragraph <laughs> this week. <laughs> yeah, I got it out. Um, I, optimistic. Back when I was doing community organizing, people would ask me that, and I, I don't do the binary pessimism, optimism. I feel like I'm committed to being present and connected with the human beings around me and supporting people's hearts to express themselves and I keep it to that. Like I, one of the um, historical incidents that has stuck with me since I was a little girl were, was the, um, I think they were a quartet, they were the musicians on the Titanic who played when it was going down. And I think as artists, we're either gonna go down or we're not but we're gonna keep making art the whole time. It's our role while we're here. So. Hi, so I'm a super geek nerd. It's, it's really blurred, black nerd, you should know that. Um, <laughs> and so um, this past week or last week, um, there was another murder in, uh, by the police in, in uh, Minnesota. And as I was posting about it, I, I checked in with my body, and my body, I didn't have any different feeling in my body or my mind. And um, a quote came to me from <clears throat> the Avengers, and earlier, I think in the movie, Captain America had asked Bruce Banner, who turns into the Hulk, like what his secret was, like how did he control hulking out or, and not. And he said, um, the, the trick is, I'm always angry. I'm always angry. Um, I think 
it's, I have another poem called Spinky, Speaking in Tongues, and it's in my collection, my first collection, and um, when everybody started to, you know, like, post and ruminate on being isolated because of the virus and, like, the, the, the protests that were going on and the worries about COVID and everything, and I just thought, wow, this is really interesting. You know, I feel like a lot of people have now or are now experiencing the isolation, the constant worry that plays in the back of the minds of a lot of global majority people. Um, and we still have to go to work and we still have to pick up our children and we still have to, you know, function as human beings that aren't burning shit down every single day. And, um, you know, in the back of my mind, like, and, and I, I hope this isn't perpetuating the stereotype of the angry black woman because we always get that when we're passionate. Uh, I really, your piece, yeah. Um, but we always wanna burn shit down because our children are not safe. Um, a, a colleague of mine once said, you know, we were going on a trip and I was like, oh, just a minute, I'm sending, I, I would send emails to my sisters that were just in case letters, in case anything happened to me or anything happened to my children. And my children always give me a hard time because I insist that we say goodnight to each other and I love you. And like, no moment is promised. Mm -hmm. And my colleague was like, that's a really pessimistic view. Like, I think that's a little extreme. And I was like, interesting, because you don't have to think about those things. Um, so I feel like my writing is hopeful, but it's, um, I think like, like Kate said too, I write to understand, to get the feelings out. Um, so I can function. Sorry, that was long. We like the long answers. I wanna, yeah, ask one. Does this, oh, okay. <laughs> I have so many things that popped into my mind while you were all talking and in response. First, I'm still accepting that I'm an artist, so it just is weird for me. Um, I think the first thing that popped into my mind, and I, I, I'm not gonna say it in Spanish, but it's a quote that someone just said recently that really resonated with me. And part of what has helped keep me optimistic during these times, and I hate translating, but it's something I like... Spanish. I know, I can't remember the, the first, how do you say difficulties again? Sí. So, las dificultades son, oh no, alimentan a la fe. So, difficulties are basically the food for faith. And I needed that when I heard that. You know, and it reminds me of when I started the nonprofit, the Tacoma Women of Color Collective. And I still believe this, but what I started with was that we're magic. And I know that's like such like a coined phrase, almost like cliche, but I, I said that because we, as women of color, right, as, you know, as black women, women of color, indigenous women, we always create something out of nothing. Whether it's tortillas, whether it's fry bread, whether it's beans with a little bit of bacon, and cilantro and onion, and like, it's a bomb, ass meal. We create something out of nothing. And I think that for me, that's what writing is. You know, that's what all of this is, is like we've, we take what we have. Sometimes it's a little bit, sometimes it's something, sometimes it's nothing. And sometimes we're like literally in the negative and we're here, you know? So I feel like our optimism and joy, like we literally, it's like, you know, a fountain. I remember I went to Rome and that was my first time ever having water that like have you, has anyone been there where you can drink it out of the fountain? They're like, oh, this is like a thousand years old or something coming out of the earth. I feel like that's us. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's there. And writing is the opportunity to get to drink that water. Thank you all for sharing that. Wow. Are there any other questions in the audience? Sure. Um, so I'm 
like that, and sometimes I just shove it out. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm not the only person who does that. So I was curious if you had any resources or communities that you have mm -hmm. found over the years that helped you navigate that. Oh, I just want to say the last week in February is the mixed race conference. I, I cannot remember the name, but look it up. If you just look at the names of the talks that they're presenting at this conference, it's like medicine, like, blah, 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 like up and down. So um, that's one, I think, for me. For um, our listeners online um, and for folks who might not have been able to hear, the question was, um, do we know of any resources for um, talking about living in the fullness of being mixed race? Yeah, and then two others I can, can name is um, there's a mixed race meditation group that comes out of San Francisco and they, they do weekly meditations, they do a book club and they have a Slack channel. So I'm on that every day. And, um, and then there's uh, a woman named Clarissa Frank who writes and coaches about being mixed. And so I, I would say those are Two of those resources I use regularly, and I'm, I don't know that I'll have time to like stream into that conference in February, but it, it looks really, really great. So, And if you want to give me your info, I can send you a link to it. I want a link, too. OK. <laughs> link in bio. Yeah, no, I'll just give you <laughs> That was a wonderful question. I'm also mixed race. Um, and like you, I often don't know where to go to find resources, so I latch on to people who are willing to let me latch on to them, these beautiful humans, and um, I try to learn through relationship. Um, thank you for asking that. Uh, one of our watchers, watchers, viewers, there we go, I do words, um, <laughs> has a question about the writing process, and the question is, um, once y'all finish a draft of a poem, and this, this is kind of funny to me, um, they ask, what process do you use to refine your work to its final form? <laughs> and we're all giggling because um, we're all writers, and I don't know if there's ever really a final form, but I think the spirit of, of what they're saying is um, final-ish. Um, when I was reading my, my poem for Tacoma Creatives, I realized I was not reading the final version. And I was like, oh, because mm. <laughs> we are always tinkering with it, you know? Um, and uh, writers or poets are often given the um, advice, or at least I was, um, let the poem become what it needs to be. And that, that just makes me so irritated, because I'm like, no, I have a, I have a point that I want to make. Um, and it's interesting because I never really appreciated it until I started writing a play and my advisor said, you're writing this like fiction, you need to write it, and it's not fiction, you need to write your play like it's poetry. And then, then I understood because I, I wasn't letting the play be what it needed to be. Um, so I grudgingly um, have started doing that with, with my poetry and not holding so tight to that message that I wanna send and more, um, working to make it the strongest piece of writing that might resonate with people, even if that takes it away from like an autobiographical slant or, or anything like that. Um, and then sometimes I'm really stubborn. I really love alliteration. I love pantoons. And um, a big shift for me was realizing that, I mean, I knew it. I'm an English teacher for Pete's sake. Not every poem needs to be a pantoon. I know that, <laughs> but I love that form. But breaking, breaking poems out of the pantoon form when it doesn't work out, that was huge for me. That's yeah. so hard to allow yourself to take writing out of the form you've put it in. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. But we're always tinkering. Um, that's why there are so many you know, versions of different things out there, because even back in the day, people couldn't let it go. <laughs> yeah, the question is, um, when you're working on something and you've got a draft, um, what sort of process do you use to refine that into something you would consider finished or finished-ish? I can go if you're still thinking. Um, 
I tend to do, I, this is what works for me. I don't know if anyone else has found this similar sort of system, but I tend to, I'll like write something down in a frenzy and then maybe put it, like change the form once, look over it once, and then I tend to not look at it again for like weeks and weeks and maybe like months. And then I come back when I'm like, okay, what do I have in this notebook? I don't even remember. And then that's when I go through and I'm like, okay, this line is good and this line is good. Because for me in the moment, I'm too attached to every single word and I want to just, I want to keep them all. Um, but it's much easier for me to distance myself from it, forget about it, and then come back and pluck the gems out and put that into something new. The other day I actually just did this and um, I was trying so hard to make this one poem work and it just wasn't happening and it wasn't happening and then I turned the page in the notebook and there was a new poem and I realized that that was the second half oh. of the first one and I had written them days apart but then I got to put them together. So that's what works for me. I think it's really helped for me that I don't really see myself as a writer. So I just write whatever I feel, and it happens to oftentimes have a cadence to it. Um, and that's happened to me too, where I've been like, oh my God, this is the other half. Mm -hmm. Like I wrote this in 2019 and I just wrote this now and they go together, you know? And I think like for me, what has helped me just refine work is like, when I write it, letting it go, like letting it live its own life after that. It just, and then I learn things from my writing coach. <laughs> She's like, well, this, I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> so that's really helpful, just letting it go. Jesse, did you want to add something? Uh, no. <laughs> You're giving me a <laughs> Um, I think we'll have time for just one or two more questions from the audience, and uh, yeah, in the back. Go ahead. I actually put mine on the platform. Oh, perfect. So, um, you're all such powerful writers, and I so appreciate being here, and this, my question arose as sort of a response to the, another question from an audience member, just because language is so powerful, and we use words like these dark times, and I totally understand the use of that. I wonder, like, do you have other words that, you, I don't know, maybe you write about it in the book, I'll get the book, but like alternatives to the, to the power, powerful words to describe what's going on. You know what I mean? Like, mm. if, for instance, with that word, dark. Mm. That's a good question. That sounds like the topic for an anthology. Yeah. Like, how do we talk about now? These That's dark times. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say something? Yeah, of course. I, um, I don't know if I've ever thought of it as dark times because I think, I, I shared a little bit today in my reading, but I think that, you know, at least I'll speak for myself, my own life in particular has been so much contrast. I call dark times contrast. You know, it's the contrast to life because it's just like, you know, to know light, you must know darkness, right? So it's like contrast is what makes you really see something in my experience, right? Same thing with joy, like, you know, grief and tears and suffering and longing, you know, really emphasizes the contrast of joy and just like exhilaration. Um, and so maybe that's the way I've reframed it, you know? And that started way back when I was like a first grader, a second grader, I think. I just started to reframe those experiences. You know, I think we all probably have different words for that. I think now as like a person that's learned vocabulary, I just am like, it's the contrast of life. Mm -hmm. If you all will allow me to butt in a little bit. Um, I think this, for me, as somebody who kind of helps facilitate stories, taking, um, taking the shape of a book, I, I'm in a similar camp to Lydia in where um, I tend to be pessimistic, and I always have, and I don't really see these times as being terribly different than what they previously were. I just feel like now more people are forced to tune into the reality that people of color have been living for so long. 
and I think the pandemic really served as the catalyst for that. Um, I will say the, that, um, like Kate, I tend to let my pessimism exist more on the page than anything else, and the beautiful thing about poetry is you actually don't have to find a better word. You can use like 200 words or 100 words to convey a, a whole image, a whole feeling, um, and that gives me the space as a human walking through the world to not just like dump on my loved ones <laughs> and, and just carry all that frustration and anger. Um, I think that's a great question because uh, you can really see um, how folks walk through the world. Yeah. I think I'm really blessed in that um, I have a 16 year old son and Gen Z is kicking ass, man. Oh my God, they are, yeah. And, and yes. I also, I teach. You know, I teach in the middle school, I teach um, uh, college age, and they are not playing around. And there are so many things that I'm like, oh, okay, you know, that's what we're doing now? Like, all right, you know, this is it, they just, you know, um, about consent, about um, mm -hmm. who they are as people and being respected for that, about um, this earth, about um, standing in truth and not waiting until they're older to make a stand. And, and not that, you know, when we were younger, we weren't kind of, um, in, well, me, y'all, not y'all, maybe, um, but me, um, that we weren't, you know, on fire. But there is a unity with, with Gen Z, I think, that perhaps comes from the connection that they can make through social media and the um, organization that they can have and the way that they can get their voices out there and, and, and change stuff because they're not playing around. And so um, even though there is a lot that we are facing, I feel like this world better take note because, um, and we're a young country. That's the other thing to keep in mind. Like we are a really young country and we haven't had a turnover in the way that we were founded that a lot of other countries had hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So it's also a really interesting time to think like, yeah, it was founded on a lot of not so great stuff. So, you know, it is time for those things to be unearthed and um, destroyed and rewritten and fixed and questioned. And so I think there is space now and there's also a lot of pushback. So we just have to be ready. We have to be ready for the fight. We have to be ready to just reconcile the fact that we are never going back to the way that things were before for a lot of different reasons, and um, follow the lead of, of the young people. All right, I think that's a great note to end it on. Um, look, can we get a round of applause for all of our amazing leaders? And I also want to say thank you all for coming out this evening and spending your time and energy with us and um, just holding this space together. And thank you to Town Hall Seattle, of course, for hosting us. Um, and also to the Tacoma Arts Commission, who partially funded this anthology. And without them, um, we wouldn't have this book here. Uh, so thank you all for coming out. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to support these writers and the press in Town Hall Seattle, check out some of our books, tell your friends about us, send poems to people you care about and love, um, and just really try to engage with the work. Uh, and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna go sell some books. And I want you all to read some books. And thank you. Thank you for being here. bottle water.